Um, hi. So, my last opportunity to chat with you. How you doing? I'm excited. I'm excited for you. I think it's going to be a wonderful roller coaster ride you're about to get on. One last thing I'm going to do with you, though. Um, if you have Bibles, open them up to Philippians chapter 2. Mr. Lavilla, you've got a nice big voice. Would you read us, please, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12? Oh, look, there's the lost sheep. Welcome. Okay, that's fine. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with your salvation. Okay, the last phrase. Work out your salvation. With fear and trembling. It's dangerous to jump in to parachute in the middle of a chapter and pick up what you find underneath your feet and just build your theology on one verse at a time. But let's do that for a minute. Forget about the rest of what you know about chapter 2. Focus it on that verse. What does that verse mean? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If that's all you knew, what does that mean? Not a rhetorical question. You can talk. Huh? Huh? That it's a scary thing, right? So fear and trembling is a part of it. Is this fear like, oh, I'm going to get eaten? Fear? Or is fear this of fear of the Lord? What does it mean to have fear of the Lord? Honor him, respect him, okay? Realize that, you know, if, if you are in the presence of a greater person, you're supposed to show respect and honor and deference and realize that they are of a higher status than you and you need to be humble before them. Uh, our culture doesn't emphasize that nearly enough, but that's the idea here, that you are before the Lord, and he is awesome. He is mighty, and he holds your enti entire destiny in his hands. So there's some honor, respect, righteous trembling before him, right? Okay. What else does it mean? What, what does it mean to work out your salvation? Wow, it's quiet. Sure Are you about to graduate from a Christian school? Talk. Make sure you solidify your faith. Solidify your faith. Yeah. Unpack that for me. Uh, make sure you make sure that you're doing all your duties for your life and not for yourself. Okay. You know you're saved. Okay. 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 If you are working something out, tell me about that project. It's and not finished. It's not done yet. Right? You were working out your composition project until this morning. While you're working it out, are you involved? Yes. Are you, are you doing things? Definitely. Definitely. We, we are of the church tradition that emphasizes what the Holy Spirit does in your life. And Pastor Ed says all the time, and he's right, that this, is, this school is a work of the Holy Spirit. And this is God working in you. But Paul says that you're also supposed to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So this isn't the only verse about salvation, and I'm really, really glad. Because if, if you just jump on this verse and you say, how are you saved? Well, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now all of a sudden we're Muslims, right? And you've got you've to do all the good things that God requires you to do, and you've got to do it on your own. And when you die, you hope that the scales weigh out in your favor. That's not Christianity, but this is an inspired verse of the Lord. So without becoming a Muslim, tell me what it means to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Do your best to stay in the will of God. I like that. I'm going to even write that down.
What else? A fear of disappointing. But like, not not like like a bad kind of fear. Like like not wanting to. Because like you love. Someone. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Respect like the dishonor. Exactly. Like you know that verse that says, "If you love me, you will be my commandment." Okay. So you don't want to like let them down. Okay. Yeah. So love and fear, which is an interesting pair to make, but they both lead you to obedience. Okay. What else? You wake up in the morning. You face your day. Starting tomorrow, you will face every day without me getting to yell at you. Okay? You wake up, you face your day. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling that day. So there's a whole day full of decisions for you. What are you going to wear? Pretty soon, uniforms are not going to be mandated unless you go to a university that requires that, but I can't think of any. So what you wear gets to be a decision. Does it honor the Lord? Does it not? What you eat gets to be a decision, right? It is already probably. Very few of you probably have every meal provided for you by your parents. You're probably at the point where you provide at least some sustenance on your own. I hope, or you're going to starve soon. Um, uh, everything that you do, how you posture your heart for that day. Did you spend time in the Word? Did you spend time in prayer? Here comes that frustrating person that you just don't get along with no matter how much you try. How are you going to interact with them? Here comes that bill in the mail. How are you going to handle that? Time to go to work. How do I present myself to my coworkers? Every day is full of, I'm not kidding, thousands of opportunities for you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I, I just realized, you know, this word salvation is there. It's not, it's not work out your walk or work out your, work out your appearance, work out your um, reputation. This is kind of the core thing. This is like the nugget. This is what your life had better get right. Because if your life gets everything else right and you screw up the thing called your salvation, there's a problem. There's a big problem. Every day, you are going to get the opportunity to walk towards Christ a thousand times or turn around and walk against him a thousand times. And I wish I could tell you that in my life, I've done nothing but walk towards Christ, but I'd be a liar and that'd be step away. Um, I've made lots of mistakes. I still make mistakes, guys. I hope you don't get the impression from me that I'm like holier than now. Totally not. I screw up all the time. Uh, I got to go talk to Pastor Ed this morning about a mistake I made. So I'm there too. We make mistakes. We do dumb things. Uh, but every day is full of these things. Every day. And you need to you need to be involved. The Holy Spirit inspiring Paul says, guys, there's some of this that I've put in your hand. Right? The Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2, is the guarantee of your salvation. He is the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit says you're saved, you're saved. But he has put something in your hand and he said, I'll do my part. You do your part. Now, I'm really glad it's not my decision up in heaven when you die. And I'm glad there is no such thing as the scales. I'm glad the Muslims are wrong. Totally wrong. But there is some aspect where you will be held accountable for what God has put in your hands. Right? Right? That the pictures of, Christ, of judgment for the Christian is not, will I get into heaven or will I not get into heaven? That's not, that's not in jeopardy for those who are in Christ. But what's the judgment we face is God will, it's essentially an award ceremony, right? The, the Bema Seat judgment of Christ, where he says, hey, I've given you this, and you did stuff with it. Praise the Lord. Come into, come into my glory. Enjoy what I've got for you. Or Paul talks about people escaping through the flames, right? You're, you're escaping, you're going to heaven, but boy, Adi, you did bupkis with what I gave you, right? He's put something in your hands. Every day, there's thousands of chances for you to work out your salvation if you're in trouble. 
to take the next step towards Christ. To decide, oh, here's an opportunity to do right or not. Here's an opportunity to obey or disobey. Here's an opportunity to, to sanctify or to corrupt. And every day you get chances by the truckload to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Praise the Lord, he doesn't leave us there. What's the very, very next verse say? Hannah, you've got a Bible as well. What's 2.13 say? For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good God is at work, both to will and to work. So I love that these two verses are right next to each other. Because if you lift them both out of context, they would seem to tell you the exact opposite. If you parachute into the middle of Philippians chapter 2, and you land on verse 13, and you say, this is what I'll build my theology on, then, and you forget about everything else, you're like, oh, cool. God does it all. Awesome. All those good works that I want to do, God is at work to work. God? Work. Do it. Right? And you can say, well, I don't really want to. Oh, well, it's God who's at work to will. So it's God who even makes you want to work. So if you feel lazy, then you can say, well, God's not doing it in me today, so I don't have to do it. Right? It's, it's fantastic that these two verses are glued next to each other. And that Paul didn't bury this idea over in one book to one church and bury the other idea in another letter to another church. And we have to, like, do all kinds of Bible study to make them contrast each other. He says this, and then he says this. He says, get to work. God's put it in your hands. And then the very next breath, the very next drop of ink off of his pen is, and God is doing the work in you, and he even gives, gives you the want to. There's a huge tension here. There's a huge tension here because you, you've had me and Pastor Ed and I'm sure every other teacher that you've encountered, if they're doing their job, has been on you to will and to work, to get into the word of God, to pray, to devote your heart to the Lord. That's what this school is about. If you learned physics, good for you. If you learned chemistry, good for you. If you learned math, that's good. You should have that. All the other things I've taught you, good. What I want you to learn more than anything else, guys, I want you to have the Word of God in your heart. I want you to leave this place firmly planted on the Word of God. And we've been yelling at you, and we've been participating with the Holy Spirit to get you to will and to work. But the thing is, our time has come to an end. This is the last time you'll be in this room because you're my student. If you come back and say, hey, later on, that's cool. I'd like that. But this is the last time you're my student, right? So my ability to get you to work, to work and get you to will is coming to an end. The Holy Spirit will keep doing that in you. But I hope that I've, I've kicked you hard enough and pushed you hard enough and been used by the Holy Spirit enough that there is a will to work in you, a will to do the Word of God. I hope I've inspired you to love Scripture. I hope I've inspired you to do something for the kingdom with your life. Now, it, now I can. I just kind of. I have to come back and rest on verse twelve and say, "Well, I've pushed. I hope they work. God's going to keep pushing. The Holy Spirit's going to bring other people in your lives. You're going to have pastors. You're going to have Christian friends." Hopefully, I pray you guys get into some kind of accountability, discipleship thing when you're in college. And there's going to be other people pushing on you, and the Holy Spirit's going to use more people to will you. But, but there is the, still this tension, and it's still in your hands. God is going to be pushing on you, but he's put something in your hand to do. The Holy Spirit's going to say, I, I've called you to this, but you still have to step out and do it. The Holy Spirit's going to, going to put in your heart a knowledge that you need to change this, but you still have to change it. The Holy Spirit is going to put before you some amazing work that he's fit you to do, but you still have to do it, right? He's at work, but you've got to work. 
He's put something in your hand. And he's going to equip you and empower you and motivate you and show you the opportunity. But while it is still him who wills and him who works, you need to work it out. So there's both of these is true. Both of these are true. We started this class with a survey. The very first day, we did the influences survey. We were talking about Christian music. And we were talking about other things. And where do you devote your time? And I almost, I, I didn't just because I don't want to take the time to do the math. But I almost gave you that survey again today. Just to see if anything had changed. But you can think about yourself. Think about the you that was you in September when we started and how you answered those questions on the very first day of class. How many hours a day do you spend in the Word? How many hours a day do you spend in prayer? How many hours a day do you spend allowing worship to be going on in your environment? How many hours a day do you spend doing the stuff you have to do, sleeping and homework and, and work if you work? How many hours a day do you spend exposing your soul to the world? to secular music, to secular entertainment, to, inter to secular reading. I, I'm sure you, you might not be able to recall the exact percentages, but you can recall something about where you were then, and you know where you are now. And I'm just curious, has anything changed? My question is, has anything changed in a year of Pastor Ed yelling at you, and me yelling at you, and lots of us praying for you? And I, and I want you to know I pray for you multiple times a day, individually. I pray for you all the time, and that's going to continue going on. But what's changed in your heart? Do you still give 20% of your wake time to worldly entertainment? Tons of you wrote on that first day. You wrote in your journals, the, the first quick write you ever did for me. And you said, wow, this is eye-opening. I need to change. Lots of you said that. Lots of you said, I never thought about the fact that I spend... 20% of my time exposing myself to the world's entertainment. That has to be different. It's been a year. Is it different? Maybe it has. I, I hope it has. I pray it has. I don't know if it has. Some of you, I've seen growth this year. Some of you, I haven't. But, but the Holy Spirit is the only one who knows the truth, right? He's the only one inside your life, looking at your life from the inside out. Are you different? In the year of us participating with the Holy Spirit to push on you, have you worked? Have you changed? And if you have to honestly look at yourself and say, no, I haven't, I'm still, I would still answer that survey exactly the same way, that I need, to, I need to remind you that every day is full of a thousand choices. And you're going to walk out of here and you're going to go to your next place and lots of you aren't going to Christian colleges, which is fine. It's fine. I'm not going to hate on you if you're not. It's fine. But you're going to be in an environment that is less Christward in its direction and its focus. And if you have not grown this year in this place, how in the world are you going to grow next year in that place? Or you maybe you have grown this year. Praise the Lord. You've grown this year in this place. Now you're going to be there in that place. How are you going to keep the momentum going? What are you going to keep doing? What are you going to do different? Right? It's easy to accelerate if you're on a bike going down the hill, but then but then when the hill stops, how do you keep accelerating? you got to pedal your butt off. It's going to take some work, right? God is going to work in your life, but he's put something in your hand. And there's a tension there, and the math doesn't work. This is one of the many places in Scripture where... One plus one is not two, where it's like, this is true. No, just kidding. The exact opposite is true. Let me write them down next to each other and hand it to you and tell you that both of these came from the Holy Spirit. Okay, so is God going to grow me up or do I have to grow myself up? Yes. Is God going to do all the work of sanctification in my life or do I have to put my boots on? Yes. Is God going to give me the desire to know and love him or do I have to work on that with fear and trembling? Yes. You gotta do both. God is at work in your life, but He's put stuff in your hand. Right? And I want you to, to take that message from me. That you're grown ups now. You're done. We're about to put our seal of approval on you in a couple days. Congratulations. Inspected by quality inspector number 27. Passed. Right? Um, we're
work out your salvation. Allow God to work in your life. Um, I I love y'all. I've been working for you, with you for a long time. And I, I know that God's going to do great things in your lives. I've been praying for you a bunch. I'm going to keep praying for you a bunch. And I hope that you pick up the, the tools in your hand and work and make great stuff happen. That's the end of that. Any questions or comments or reflections or challenges? It's fine. Anybody? What does it make you think about?